as if the big Cascadia mega thrust earthquake with a magnitude 9 plus wasn't enough for the Pacific Northwest to deal with. There's something else that they found in Canada that can cause huge troubles for the Northwestern US. A newly discovered, guys, 50 mile long fault line in Canada could cause a massive tsunami in the Northwestern US if it ruptures and it could hit major cities. We'll talk about that in a second. So over a million Americans in the Northwestern US could be at risk of a tsunami due to a newly discovered fault line. Scientists have found an approximately 50 mile long fracture in the earth that runs through British Columbia in Canada and escaped detection for thousands of years guys and now we know it's there and it's a bad one unfortunately experts suspect that because of the layout of that fault it could spark a large earthquake in canada that comes in addition i mean something needs to cause that tsunami so that is a large earthquake great as if western canada hadn't enough fault lines already the big one another big one and Queen Charlotte fault line and so many others. So if this quake happens from that new fault line that you see on the map behind me, it's basically on the tip of Vancouver Island. The effects of this quake could generate a tsunami in the area around the Georgia Basin, which could hit parts of Washington as well as British Columbia. So the discovery was made by a team that included researchers from the University Grenoble Alps in France. And they found that the faults two massive rock blocks slipped against each other and generated a major earthquake several thousand years ago. So they found evidence that this is a bad one. And they're saying that it's possible that this could happen again. Oh, that's not good. In fact, because of the Pacific Northwest's numeral geological fault lines that we all know are dangerous and not that newly discovered one, right? Scientists are encouraging people to stay prepared for a possible earthquake. They're saying you should always have several days worth of food, water, medicine, and emergency supply. And if the big one hits there, I think you need several weeks or even months of supplies until help could arrive. They have named it the X I don't know how to pronounce this. I don't know why it's such a stupid name. The Xiolxelec Elk Lake Fault. I don't know how you're supposed to say that. Are you just supposed to say X E O L X E L E K Elk Lake Fault? Whatever. But this is the fault. Um, and that geological intersection runs diagonally across the Saanich Peninsula that's north of Victoria, the capital of British Columbia in Canada, and north of Victoria basically from the northwest to the southeast. So the reason why this could possibly be so destructive is that this fault line, it's known as a dip-slip fault. It's basically where two blocks of rocks move up and down as their point of contact as opposed to side to side. So this fault would likely rupture underwater and would produce vertical offset of the Earth's surface. There is potential that an earthquake on this fault would produce a local tsunami in the Georgia Basin. And if you hear local tsunami, that doesn't sound that bad. You have to look at what the Georgia Basin is and what's located there. We know that most earthquakes occur along the edges of tectonic plates, known as plate boundaries. There, this is clear. And this new X whatever L flake fault, two blocks of earth meet and one slipped upward, so to speak. 
So if the seafloor in the Haro Strait one day gets pushed up by an earthquake, it could push up against the water overlying it into the surrounding Georgia Basin. And even if the seafloor was uplifted only by a few meters, this can be enough to displace several cubic kilometers of water and send a series of waves outward from the earthquake epicenter. It's like being in a bathtub and you lift up your leg a little bit. And if the bathtub is quite full, it flows over. And then the tsunami waves travel away from the earthquake epicenter in all directions. And you might wonder, how high can these tsunami waves get? Well, that depends on several factors. So it depends on the height of the tsunami, depends on how, the, how high they will be on shore, depends on several factors such as the distance and the direction from the earthquake epicenter, the depth and shape of the seafloor and the shape of the coastline. So what's in this Georgia basin? What's under threat from this new fault line? Well, Canada could send a tsunami to Bellingham, Seattle, Tacoma, and Olympia in the US, but also in Canada to Vancouver, Victoria. So they have evidence that this Elk Lake Fault did cause an earthquake in the last 12,000 years. So we have to consider or we have to assume that this is an active fault and that it could definitely host another earthquake of a similar magnitude or lesser. We don't know to the one that these researchers have observed. The ancient quake they think had a magnitude between 6.1 to 7.6. It has rock regions along this fault line, roughly anywhere between 4,700 to 2,300 years ago. If you compare it, a magnitude 6 earthquake has the power equivalent to like 60 million kilograms of TNT and a magnitude 7 is, is way accelerated, has the power of 20 billion kilograms of explosive TNT. So an earthquake of these magnitudes would be damaging, especially given its proximity to urban areas, if we see where that new fault line is. In terms of timeline, the researchers say it is not possible to predict when this fault will cause the next earthquake, but it is there. So it's good to be aware of this. So it could rock the over 400,000 people that live in the direct vicinity of the fault, but it could create a tsunami in this larger region. So according to the researchers, quote, this particular fault certainly has implications for people in the US as we map it to possibly connect underneath the Haro Strait and the US border to the Devil's Mountain Fault in Washington State. So a rupture could extend to the United States. And even if it didn't, a large earthquake on that Elk Lake Fault would be felt by people in the Northern Puget Sound area as well. So to calculate when an event like this would occur is difficult and challenging even for geologists. But what they can do is look at the past earthquake recurrence interval. That's the average number of years between earthquakes. And the new study that has been conducted and that found this fault line is limited in making this calculation because it requires at least two earthquakes to calculate the number of years between them. But they only have found evidence of one. This is just fresh. Hopefully they'll found more evidence. But even if they did have two quakes, keep in mind this is a very rough calculation because the times between earthquakes can still vary hugely. So they need to do, and that's what they're saying, more study to better understand the hazard of this fault line. So what they have done and how they have explored that fault line, they have 
digged a trench across it and then they have searched for signs of earthquakes and fault line shifts in the geological history. The rocks are basically the time capsules that would tell them what happened. And they used like magnetic field changes. This is what was telling them what was happening because the minerals in these rocks, they have different levels of magnetism. So measuring these differences can show whether large rock formations formed at the same time and stayed in shape or whether they were broken up. And what they found was that sometime after glaciers had carved the landscape, the slip dip fault had shifted the land. As I said, within a time frame of the last 12,000 years, more likely 4,700 to 2,300 years ago. I know many people, they just think that there's only the Cascadia Fault megathrust earthquake that is a threat to the Pacific Northwest. But there's so much more, there's so many more tiny little fault lines. And who knows if one of these other fault lines slips and creates a big earthquake, could that trigger the monster, the Cascadia Fault? Who knows? They have found out that at the San Andreas Fault, for example, there's lots of tiny other falls that go vertical towards the San Andreas Fault. And they say that it's possible that if there's more smaller faults creating earthquakes and shock waves, that they could trigger parts of the San Andreas Fault. So the Earth is very diverse and very active. And it's good to be aware of that, especially if you live in the Pacific Northwest, like I do. If you found that interesting, guys, please leave it a like, subscribe if you're new here for more, and definitely check out the video on the end screen. Very, very interesting stuff. And if you want to support my channel, buy me a coffee. I have this buymeacoffee.com slash silky site where you can support the channel. And of course, with the super here on YouTube or by becoming a monthly supporting member of the channel. So thanks for everyone who's doing this. And I hope I see you safe and sound in the next video. Check out the video here on the end screen. Bye guys.